Dr. Wallace, thanks for joining us here on Health Connection. Our topic is mosquito-borne illness because that is in the news. Uh, we've been talking a great deal about the Zika virus, but let's go backwards in time a little bit and start go, go back to other mosquito-borne illnesses that we've worried about, West Nile virus. Let's just talk about mosquito-borne illnesses and why we're so afraid of them. Uh, it's one of those things in nature that we don't necessarily have a lot of control over. So some of it relates to environmental conditions, dry season, wet season, um, mosquitoes. We had a tough winter or we had a mild winter and the mosquitoes all survived. I mean, so it's uh, the things that put us at risk, the presence of these mosquitoes is totally not under our control. Where are they getting the, the organism? Where is it coming from? For some diseases, it comes from other human beings. For the Zika virus, we don't know that it exists in animals or birds or reptiles. It's in people. So by monitoring people, we can tell we're at risk. But for West Nile, for example, it's a bird disease primarily. And so it was first identified in the West Nile area in migratory birds, and it's one of the reasons that it spread so quickly in the United States is that intercepted migratory birds in the Northeast where it was first identified, well, they all came south, and so within a year we had West Nile virtually everywhere we had flyways, which is everywhere in the United States. So, and again, we had no control over that, and this really depends on the birds, the bird population, what's successful, what flies over. Dallas, for example, had a horrible year with West Nile a couple of years ago, probably related to bird flyovers that nobody paid much attention to that brought in a lot of birds that were infected. Um, mosquitoes bit the birds, then bit people, and they got West Nile. Well, moving from West Nile to Zika, the Zika virus, describe it. What is it and what does it do? Zika is the name of a forest in Uganda where this virus was first identified. Nobody knows about it because it was never important, it never caused any serious disease. Most of it was pretty well localized in Africa. We didn't know that it caused any kind of a serious illness, so no research has been done. Nobody, most of us in infectious disease had never heard of it. I personally never heard of it. Um, but when it was recognized that it was associated with probably congenital malformations, a horrible, horrible disease that ultimately leads to the demise of the, of the newborn baby, uh, then that's made it into a serious illness. Very focal in terms, but it affects the population that's probably we're most sensitive to in terms of protecting them, which is newborn babies. Why is it seemed to be associated with South America? Good question, and why, why did it start there? Um, and the presumption is there must be some connection that we're not aware of between this area in Africa and ending up in Brazil. I mean, that's not something that I've seen a great deal about, but presumably related to populations of people who were infected within that time frame when it was still present in their blood coming to another area of the world. And world travel is one of the major reasons that we continue to see new diseases like Zika. If Zika is present in a person's blood, mm -hmm. can that person then transmit the disease independently of uh, insect vectors? So say, for example, sexually or through contact or aerosol, can that person transmit the disease? They can. Um, there's a precedent for that. There are other viruses uh, for which sexual transfer of disease is very common. HIV, for example. The big one. The big one. Um, in some countries, um, sexual transmission is the primary mode of transition. Um, in the U.S., it's more related to drugs, but still, it's a very common way of transmitting it. It's known to be present in the male semen. Um, it's also present in the female vaginal secretions. So it can be transmitted either way. The, the greatest risk is male to female. This is true for HIV, but also appears to be true for Zika. So theoretically, 
a, a man, for example, could travel to South America to go to Rio for business, come back, have sexual intercourse with his wife, and now two people in the house have the Zika virus, correct? Yes. So it is one of the viruses that can be transmitted by sexual relations, mostly sexual intercourse. And it can go both ways. It's also present in vaginal secretions, but primarily has been identified in male semen. Um, and obviously the volume of potentially infectious material is larger, but that is going to create, if you have a large enough population that are infected, then control of the disease becomes much more difficult. It's just what, what, one more worry when you have sex with your wife about terms of risk, if you're someone who has to travel to other parts of the world, at least for now, where Zika is, is common. Well, let's talk about Zika. For, it is most frightening for women of childbearing age, and that's where its most profound effects will be noticed. But aside from that, what, are, what symptoms are we looking for? Most people, probably at least 80% plus, have absolutely no symptoms at all. Um, if they do have symptoms, it's sort of like a mild flu, a little aching, a little fever, and that's it. And it's one of the reasons that very little attention was paid to the virus until we recognized that it was associated with congenital malformations if you got the virus while you were pregnant. So in terms of controlling this disease, how, how, do, we, how do we test for it and how is it managed? In, in a developed country like the United States, there are two ways to test for it. One is to test individuals who have symptoms or at high risk for Zika. The other is we know the specific type of mosquito that causes the disease. So we normally, many areas, do mosquito sampling. We have traps um, that they do at periodic intervals. And if there is an increase in mosquitoes, an increase in West Nile, they do a lot more, and then they do actual testing on the, the mosquitoes that are captured to see if the virus is present. If the virus is present, then we start putting out warnings, especially true for West Nile, because it's present in birds in larger numbers. Um, there are other types of encephalitis. There's what's called equine encephalitis. It's related to horses. That's the primary risk. Per so the, the vets may tell us, I have horses that are exhibiting strange neurologic behavior, um, then we do the testing, then we do the mosquitoes, and we tell people they're at risk for the virus. How frightening is it for you as an infec infectious disease physician that this disease is, uh, this virus is largely asymptomatic in most of its carriers? It's going to mean that for every case that we identify, there's going to be eight to ten people with no symptoms at all. So you could have a large number of the population who are infected and at risk for transmission and have no symptoms. And if you happen to be pregnant and you're in the middle of that population, you don't even know that it's present in your community or in your neighborhood. And in fact, it's a very high risk area. So testing of mosquitoes is also important because you would probably pick it up in your pool of mosquitoes. Um, but a lot of countries like Brazil and other not quite as developed countries can't do that. They're dependent on cases to do it. But we're not going to know about most of the spread because most of it is asymptomatic. Well, let me ask you a question that you probably can't answer, but let's try it anyway. Out of a thousand people who go outdoors in the summertime when mosquitoes are around, how many of them are going to be bitten in such a way that they will become infected? Depending on the precautions that you take, um, you potentially could have a very large number. But again, it doesn't, the disease is such a minor disease. Um, the, the, the issue is how do we deal with it in terms of people who want to get pregnant, includes the husband as well or the significant other as well as the wife. He has to exhibit, do the same precautions that she does because she could get it from him. So it becomes a much more complicated issue in terms of trying to protect yourself. But there are things you can do, and we talk about those, to limit your exposure to the mosquitoes. Now, one of the things about Zika, it is a daytime mosquito. One of the things about West Nile, it's a nighttime mosquito. Right. So you, we can tell you, put on 
long clothing and that when you do it at night, but you're okay during the daytime. You're not okay with the Zika virus. So anybody who goes outside and goes into an area that has mosquitoes is at risk for getting the virus. So the risk is greater, harder to control. I mean, not everybody's gonna to wanna to put on long clothing and spray themselves with mosquito repellent. And, that's a pro and that may be a problem. And that may be one of the reasons we'll have a hard time controlling the disease. Last question on the terms of controlling the disease. Once you've, the virus has entered your body, do you carry it and transmit it for the rest of your life? Is it like herpes that just never is gone from your body? No, it is a limited virus. It may live in the bloodstream for one to two weeks, um, maybe longer in some areas, but in general it's gone. I, I'm just making this up, but I would say within a month it's gone from everywhere in the body. And once you have it, you can't get it again. And that lends itself to the idea of a vaccine. And so one of the reasons that a vaccine and that it's so important for Congress to spend money on a vaccine, it's not about now. If Zika is here indefinitely, it's for every woman who wants to get pregnant, every woman who is pregnant. It would become part of the regular vaccines that we would give to people when they want to become pregnant. And so think about the difficulties if we don't have that vaccine. So part of what we're asking here for is people are very reluctant to spend the money. This is a very important vaccine long-term in terms of protecting women who want to get pregnant in the U.S. Doctor, thank you for your time. Thank you.